Morning, Grace Church. Morning, online. Um, we're looking this morning at uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. That's on page 974 in the, the Bibles in the church. 974. And uh, Matthew 9, verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and illness. <coughs> when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. <coughs> Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Uh, thanks, Martin. Do keep that passage open. We're going to have a uh, look through. Uh, Craig, do you just want to open the door for... <laughs> uh, let me pray as we begin uh, and look through this passage that we're up to in Matthew. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you that you're a God of grace and mercy, that you reveal yourself to us through your word and spirit. And so we pray now as we look at this passage, uh, you'd remind us of your call to your church to go to all the world. That you'd remind us that we don't just have a duty to tell our friends and our neighbors of you, but as a church global to spread your gospel to the ends of the earth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, we've been uh, back in Matthew uh, since uh, I went on sabbatical, actually. Uh, and uh, up until this point in Matthew, Jesus has, has been both the hero uh, and the villain, uh, both the hero and doing all the work so far in Matthew. He's preached that glorious Sermon on the Mount that we looked at uh, last year. He's taught people, he's debated, he's healed, he's driven out demons. He's proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of heaven. He's pointed people to himself, that he is the son of God, the savior of humanity. And in these few short verses that we're looking at today, he introduces the next phase of his plan, his master plan. And that's his disciples, his friends, his followers, are now invited in to the same task that he has had up until this point. They're going to take on the same responsibility that he had. Uh, we're going to see it a bit more in the next few chapters. So chapter 10, as we'll see next week, verse 1, just have a, you can see that just below the passage today. Chapter 1, verse 1, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits, to heal every disease and sickness. And just scan down to verse 6 of chapter 10. Uh, he's going to send them to the Gentiles eventually. That's the non-Jews. But for now, he's going to start with the Israelites, the Jews. Verse 6, go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received freely give it's an identical list that he gives to them that he's been doing so far jesus is demonstrating how his mission to the world throughout time is going to be effective and it's to pass it on it starts with him it's given to his his disciples with an equal amount of power and authority that he himself came with of healing and casting out demons and finally at the end of matthew's gospel well, we'll reach eventually. The task is extended to the whole church of Christ since that time to this very day. So Matthew 28, verse 18, you can flip there or just listen. Familiar to many of us. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey, as we learned in our children's all-age slot today, to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always, 
to the very end of the age. The immediate disciples could never reach the very ends of the earth, could they? Not by themselves. And so the book of Acts, which follows on from the gospel, shows how that authority that Jesus gives to the disciples to go and make disciples is extended to the whole church and then passed on to us, the whole church throughout time. This is the heart of Jesus. This is the basis of the disciples' mission. And so it's the basis of our lives as well. And it is to see the good news of Jesus extend to the ends of the world. Uh, these verses are an in introduction, if you like, to the principles that ought to govern how we as a church, as individuals, as families, that ought to govern how we spend the rest of our lives. And it shows us three things. It's going to show us the mission. It's going to show us our motive. And it's going to show us the method. So number one, mission. Have a look at verse 35 of our passage today, Matthew 9, 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Jesus went through all the towns and city, uh, towns and villages. All is a big word. I mean, it's a, it's a small word, I grant you that, but it's a big word, isn't it? This is what Jesus is about. All, all towns and villages, going everywhere, stopping always to reach everyone he could. Uh, someone's done the maths and reckons Jesus potentially visited 204 towns and villages, 15,000 people across Galilee. That's exhausting and exhaustive. All the church's mission remained day to go to all for Jesus. Uh, the world's population is roughly 8 billion people, and 3.4 billion people are unreached by the gospel, meaning they've got no real viable means of hearing the gospel. There's not enough Christians in their uh, cultural uh, people or country. That's 42% of the world's population. I'd say we've got our work cut out as a church, haven't we? I'd say we've we ought to be doing all we can to reach those who have not heard about Jesus. Now, of course, that means some of us ought to go. Sorry, Craig, there's a few more coming in. <laughs> uh, that means that some of us ought to go to the places in the world where whole people groups haven't heard about Jesus. Uh, in fact, there's 7,276 uh, people groups around the world still. So not countries, people groups within countries. That's extraordinary. We have no chance of hearing the gospel at the moment. It's extraordinary and sad. That is why Jesus went to all. The mission is extensive and exhausting. Uh, Jesus started by going to all the unreached people groups he could get to. They knew of a Messiah perhaps coming, speaking to the Jews, but they didn't know Jesus was the, was the king, the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we should adopt the same attitude as Jesus. We, we can't just be content to tell those around us that Jesus is the Lord, the good news, as important and as essential as that is. We need to keep pushing the boundaries to share Jesus with those who have no chance to hear of him otherwise. Uh, we break our ministry here up at Grace Church into five ministry teams. One of them is in, called the Enlist Team, and uh, we oversee the, our, our budget for giving to missionaries and gospel partners around the world. And one of the things we've been trying to do over the last few years as we've uh, taken on new mission partners is prioritize the unreached, those who have got no chance at the moment of hearing the news. Uh, so Margot Knight, who will be here in two weeks' time, I think, uh, so do be here for that. Uh, she and her new husband, Fernandez, uh, I always start thinking of the Abba song at that point, but uh, don't get distracted for the whole service. Uh, they will be here in a couple of weeks and they're going off to Chad to a Muslim community, to an unreached people group to share the gospel. And so we want to support them. Uh, they might need more individual financial support. So if you're uh, after this sermon thinking you, that's a way you can encourage and help those going uh, hold on to those coppers until they come and uh, they may need some help. Uh, there's more to be done. It's exhaustive and exhausting. 
And we can ask the question, can't we? How are we doing as a church? And how are we doing as individuals? How are we putting an emphasis on the unreached, going to the all that will not hear otherwise? Where does our spending money go? Uh, on a coffee every day? Or on trying to get the gospel to those who haven't heard? Where does your five-year plan take you? To the next level of senior management? Or to a relaxing retirement? Or to a mortgage-free bliss life of holidays and comfort? Or to frontline mission in the Middle East? Or to Pakistan to reach the millions of unreached who need Jesus? Or, or to drastically increase your giving to send or support a mission partner reaching refugees in Southern Europe? Or perhaps to retirement in North Africa where you can share the good news of those who will never hear otherwise? Not everyone can go to the unreached, but everyone can seriously consider it, can't we? And everyone can support and pray for those who do go. All is a big word. It's the mission of Jesus to take his gospel, his good news, to the ends of the earth. But what is actually the mission? What are we doing when we go or when we send? Uh, well, there's three things in that verse. Jesus was teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease. Jesus taught in the synagogues. In other words, he opened the Bible. He used the Old Testament scriptures that would be traditional in those synagogues. He opened them and he taught from them to anyone that would listen. He taught the truth of God from his word. Jesus went to the places where people were ready to listen we know many will reject, but some will listen. Jesus was eventually killed for preaching what he preached, but he did it anyway. Mission is to simply teach the Bible to those who will listen to you, whether they like it or not. But it's not just general biblical teaching or theology so they know something of God. He also proclaims the kingdom of the good news. Sorry proclaims the good news of the kingdom in other words jesus proclaimed the kingdom of god everywhere he went the place where he is king a kingdom of joy and perfection where god rules himself a kingdom that is open to all who come to jesus a kingdom that doesn't need to be earned but is a free gift through the eventual death and resurrection of jesus through the Jesus himself who takes his sin and the sin of the whole world upon himself when he dies on the cross and takes the wrath of God on himself so that we might not face the eternal judgment in hell that we deserve and that the whole world, those 3.4 billion people who haven't even heard, will face. He deals with that on the cross. And we're offering the kingdom, the good news. Our mission is not social aid or work although that is a good thing to do and a right thing to do. It may well open people's hearts, hearts and ears to our message, but mission work must be verbal. It's got to proclaim the kingdom of God. It's got to be understandable, proclaimed Jesus as king. So mission is to befriend people, it's to live amongst them, it's to gain their ear, it's to love them, it's to learn their language so that we can proclaim Jesus, the good news of the kingdom, so that we can deliver people from hell to heaven with Jesus forever. Uh, Jesus, of course, alongside his uh, teaching and proclaiming of the kingdom, also was healing every disease. Uh, if you read the New Testament and the life and the work of Jesus, he is utterly extraordinary, isn't he? He healed anybody and everybody of terrible diseases, even death, raised them to new life. He never failed. He never did a half job. He never, never offered slight improvements or temporary repairs. We're not talking colds or, or a sore arm. We're talking the dead raised, the paralyzed walking, the blind seeing, the deaf hearing. He could have walked into Kingston Hospital and sent everyone home. Uh, nothing has ever or will ever happen like that again until 
Jesus returns. He will eliminate death itself. He will call out to his name. They will be saved and we will live eternally with him. And Jesus's power then points us to his return. It shows them and shows us who he was. We can be in no doubt as we read about what he did. He must be the Messiah. Uh, Matthew 8, 17, just in the previous chapter, you can see it there in your Bibles. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. They knew he was coming and here he is. Look what he's doing. In other words, Jesus did all these things to prove to the world he truly was the son of God, the one come to save. He was the promised savior of the world. He was the Messiah. He was the one promised in the Old Testament. And if he can truly do the miraculous in the physical realm, as we read about and as they saw and were eyewitnesses to them, well, then he can do the miraculous spiritually too, can't he? The spiritually dead will live. The spiritually blind will see. The spiritually deaf will hear. As we proclaim Jesus, we don't need to perform the same miracles to convince people as he did. We need to point them to the one who does it, to the Savior, to the all-powerful, so when they see him, they can live again. He uh, healed every disease on earth where he traveled, we're told. But in just two years' time from this point in our uh, section of Matthew, Jesus will be murdered on a cross. He'll accept the punishment that we deserve from God and in exchange give us his righteousness, that new spiritual life. He'll give us a perfect and good relationship with God for all time. Jesus will heal our eternal death. He's still at work. He'll give us himself, the Lord, the King. An eternity with no more pain, no more suffering, no more anxiety, no more confusion, no more death. He will come again and do it again, both physically and spiritually, eternally. The mission Jesus had was to teach all of the truth of his word to all that would listen, whether they liked it or not, to proclaim the good news of salvation to all because of who he was, to heal their diseases so that they would know who he was and trust in him, and so that they would know they would be eternally healed of sin and judgment. And our mission remains the same. So the next question is, what is our motivation? Have a look at verse 36. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. How extraordinary that God doesn't just reject the human race. He comes down to become one of us in the person of Jesus, as we've been seeing in Matthew's gospel. And despite our continued rebellion, despite the fact that some of these people here listening are going to put him on a cross, he has compassion on all of us. He describes the crowd, people like you and me, as helpless and harassed. And that's probably a pretty apt description of most of us most of the time, isn't it? But, but Jesus isn't just talking about helpless and harassed in its life is difficult sense. This is spiritual. These are sheep without a shepherd. Now, it's quite easy to read a verse like that and think, well, we should be motivated to tell those that don't know about Jesus uh, because they face God's judgment and, and no one's telling them. And, uh, and so we should just feel sorry for them. And we should be the shepherds. We, we're the ones that can save them. If we just go and do the right things and say the right things and point them in the right direction, if we can save them, we're the shepherds. Well, actually, in this passage, it's Jesus who is the shepherd. And those he looks upon are his sheep. 
You see, we're not the shepherds in this situation. Jesus is. We are the sheep. We're some of those helpless and harassed people who have found the shepherd. We're still sheep. We're not wonderful Christian people who have got it all sorted. We ought to take pity on those poor people around us who haven't yet turned their life around to follow Jesus because we haven't helped them. No, we too are lost sheep. We once did not know where our shepherd was. And we're no better and no worthy than those around the world who have not heard or don't have the chance. Uh, the only difference for us is that the shepherd has found us. He's come along and he's put his arm next to us and said, come follow me. And as we wander around in this field of life, we will find other sheep. And we simply need to show them Jesus, the shepherd. That's our job. Come, I, I found the shepherd. We too are helpless and harassed. And apart from the shepherd who leads us by still waters and makes us lie down in green pastures, we would be and are nothing. But with him, we are everything. And so we call others to the shepherd. Our motivation to tell others the good news about the shepherd, about who Jesus is, about the good news of salvation through Jesus the Lord, is that we have found a shepherd and we don't deserve him, but he has come to us anyway. He wants to show everyone his grace and his mercy. We are motivated to save many, the all, because we have been shown the compassion that Jesus wants to show them already. Sometimes we're sort of tied up in our own sort of self-absorbed world, aren't we? But we barely give a second thought to how we might lead our neighbours, our extended family, our friends, let alone the, to the ends of the world. We barely give a thought to how we can lead others to that great shepherd. Our career or family or comfort or our leisure, it all comes first. It's all right in front of us, isn't it? And the good news to others comes somewhere down the list, but for Jesus... Where was it on his list? Right at the top. The good news of the kingdom for all. I am going. It's going to be exhausting. 15,000 people. Here we go. Our motivation ought to be both the example of Jesus, of his extraordinary uh, sacrifice for us, and also our gratefulness and our joy and the salvation that we have in him the life we now have with the Jesus as our shepherd, that we can point others to him. Now, there is a, a second type of motivation in a little passage. Uh, verse 37 says this. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. It's true, isn't it? Uh, and sad. The harvest, the available population who hasn't heard of the gospel of Jesus yet, is massive but the number of sheep out there who know where the shepherd is is tiny and while a third of our planet's population identify as christian only about 10 percent of, the, of them are actually evangelical that's an estimated 800 million evangelical christians on the planet people who take jesus's mission that we're learning about today seriously Take, it, take his Bible, the Bible seriously and teach it and act on it. If we want more motivation than remembering that Jesus has compassion on the lost as he does on us, then we can remember that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. <laughs> Do we need more motivation than that of the crops of souls rotting in the ground eternally? Because we here in Worcester Park didn't do anything about it. And so finally, what method does Jesus want us to use to fulfill his mission? Uh, it's a simple point, this one. Uh, we've talked about the churches and our individual responsibility to teach the Bible, to proclaim the good news of the King, to point people to Jesus, our shepherd, to be motivated by our own salvation because of what the compassion that Christ has on us and those who are still lost. But Jesus actually hasn't yet once instructed us so far in Matthew or even his disciples yet to do all of those things we've talked about. He, he is going there, don't worry. He'll go on to do that. But 
what should we do to start? Where should we start? We'll be told, verse 38, ask the Lord. Verse 37, middle of that, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Jesus' method that he commands his disciples, and by extension us here today, to fulfill his mission is simple. Pray. Jesus points to prayer as the really effective thing. No matter how great our personal exertion, we will not be able to gather in the harvest. Therefore, we are to pray to him who can send out workers who are needed. Pray for more gospel-hearted men, women, and children to go out and to proclaim the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth. Simple. Pray. Uh, the uh, Bishop R.C. Ryle of Liverpool in the late 1800s said this of this passage. I, I was going to try and do an impression of him. Not that I've heard him, but I just imagine he's this like, very posh you know, English gentleman. But um, He writes this, personal working for souls is good. Giving money is good. But praying is best of all. By praying, we obtain the help of the Holy Spirit. It's true, isn't it? Working is, is good for souls, telling people the gospel. Giving our money is good, but praying is best of all. Uh, if you need some help or ideas for praying, uh, you can. Uh, we'll send all of this out in this week's email, but you can go to the Joshua Project website, which lists all the unreached people groups and the sort of state of the evangelical church around the world. Uh, you can go to mission agency websites and uh, find plenty of prayer resources there. You can go to our gospel partner website on our uh, church website and find out who we support. We're adding two or three this week who haven't quite made it, made it onto the web page yet. Uh, and we'll put all of those links in the email this week so that you can be praying uh, for them. But we can also be praying for one another, can't we? We can be praying that we'd each take more seriously. Can, can we go? Is it me? Can I retire there? Can I change my job? Can I just go by young enough to plan this as my career? We can pray in the morning. We can pray this week in our home groups. Uh, there's a short video for you to watch uh, on some of this as well. Uh, we can pray in our families. Now, of course, it's dangerous to pray. I, I'm sure you all know that. Uh, we'll find we're often the answers to our prayers as the disciples do in the very next verse of next week's passage, what does he do? He sends them out. But that shouldn't stop us praying. It shouldn't make us fearful of praying. Uh, quite the opposite. Prayer is easy. You just pray. The beauty of prayer is that it's not scary. We're talking to Jesus, our friend. We have a reverent fear and respect for our almighty heavenly father, but we come to him through Jesus, our compassionate shepherd, who only wants what is best for us, and he loves to hear from us. We don't need to know the answers when we pray. We don't need to know what God will do when we pray. We simply need to pray. Pray. Pray for workers. Pray for sheep like you and I to bring the lost sheep to Jesus. The mission is that all, that's a big word, will come to know Jesus, to hear his gospel. The motivation is that Jesus has compassion on all, people like you and me. And the means, the method, well, that's prayer. So let's do that now. Our Lord and gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you that we can come to you in prayer. You are Lord of the harvest. You know every soul that walks this earth. You know each person who is currently sleeping or working or eating or relaxing. You know that each of them, just like us, is helpless and harassed, a sheep without a shepherd, unless you have brought Jesus to them. So we do pray for workers to go out into the harvest field. 
We praise you that you choose to use your people, your church, your sheep, to extend your gospel to all the world. Make us compassionate. Make us joyful in Christ so that we may join in this great work. Raise up new workers from amongst us, from outside of us, from all over the world to go out and share the great news of the kingdom of heaven, of our King, the Lord Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.